Japanese American Dr. Michio Kaku is a scientist and a futurist who says we must leave Earth or perish. One day, the planet will become inhospitable, and his latest book, The Future of Humanity, looks at how we could get out here alive. Dr. Kaku is a professor of theoretical physics at the City College of New York, and he has become well known for his popularization of speculative science while working during his academic career on a theory of everything and string theory, of which he is the co-founder. He told me that the exit route is already being planned. Yes, already physicists and engineers are laying the groundwork for one day building ships that will take us to the outer planets and eventually the stars. My colleague Stephen Hawking, who recently passed away, he was a big promoter of the Breakthrough Starshot program that within 20 years, within 20 years, would create a bank of laser beams capable of sending a postage size starship to the nearby stars. It would go about 20% the speed of light and perhaps reach the nearest stars in about 20 years. Now, of course, to save humanity so that we don't go the way the dinosaurs, that would require building a much larger starship. And in my book, uh, The Future of Humanity, I actually give a blueprint. Now, remember that it's a law of physics that we will eventually have to leave the Earth. It's, it's a law of physics. Uh, there's no way around it. Everywhere we look in the heavens, we see evidence of stars that go supernova, explode. Uh, we see ample evidence that the stars have a finite lifespan. And when the sun dies, we will die with it, unless, of course, we leave the Earth. So we need an insurance policy. We need a backup plan. Now, we don't want to bankrupt the Earth doing it, but we need an insurance policy. Otherwise, uh, we too will go the way of the dinosaurs. That's why we should become a multi-planet species. I suppose my question is... motivating factors. Yeah. yeah. I, I suppose my question is, five billion years from now, the sun will become a red giant and burn us up. Do we have five billion years, or do you think something else will get us in the meantime? A number of things, you know, global warming or nuclear disaster or a microbial epidemic, or, as you suggest, another ice age. Well, you can choose your poison. Uh, you yes. mentioned global warming, which is here and now. There's also the threat of germ warfare and, you know, designer germs that can escape from a biotech laboratory. And uh, also, of course, nuclear proliferation. The bomb is proliferating in some of the most dangerous areas of the world. And so we have to realize that, yes, it wouldn't take that much to trigger a nuclear confrontation that spreads to the superpowers. And so we have to realize that, yes, there are some real threats that face humanity. And in the past, we've always faced these kinds of calamities. 70,000 years ago, uh, just a blink of an eye ago, a volcano erupted in Indonesia that we think wiped out most of the human race. And only a handful of us, maybe a few hundred, maybe a thousand, escaped that cataclysm to repopulate the entire Earth. So it's happened a number of times in the past that we came perilously close to total extinction, uh, much, far, much closer than the five billion years in which the sun will itself die. You mentioned Professor Stephen Hawking. He, his qualifier was that if we can avoid disaster for the next two centuries, our species should be safe as we spread into space. Do you think we can avoid disaster for the next two centuries? Well, it's hard to say. I think within 100 to 200 years, we will become what is called a type 1 civilization, a planetary civilization, a civilization at peace. Uh, where nations gradually lose power and a, a planetary civilization starts to emerge. However, the danger period is now because we have already the ability to wipe ourselves out using germs, nuclear warfare, or, or the weather. And the question is, it's a race against time. On one hand, we have the fact that, yes, global warming, these problems are here and now. But on the other hand, we realize that there are forces that are pushing the technology forward, 
and forces that are building a planetary civilization, which will be largely at peace. So I think it's a race against time, and it's not clear who's going to end the finish line first. Where are you getting your information about a planetary civilization which will be at peace? <laughs> well, we physicists rank civilizations in outer space by energy. A type 1 civilization can, for example, uh, change the weather and change the volcanoes and earthquakes. They're planetary. Type 2 civilization can control the output of an entire star, like Star Trek. Star Trek would be a typical type 2 civilization. Type 3 civilization uh, exhausts the power of a planet or star, and it harnesses the power of a galaxy and the black holes at the center of the galaxy, like the empire of the, of the Star Wars saga. So when we physicists rank civilizations by energy, we realize that we, by contrast, are type 0. We can't modify the weather or a volcano. We cannot reignite stars. We cannot roam the galactic space lanes. We're pretty much um, type zero. But we could calculate that within 100 to 200 years, we will become type one. Within a few thousand years, we will become type two, able to soar across the solar system and reach the nearby stars. On the scale of 100,000 years, we could be type three, that is, galactic. All going well. Why Mars? I mean, Mars being part of our solar system, that'll be burnt up too. What's the point in settling up Mars? Well, Venus is too hot. Uh, the temperature of Venus is 900 degrees Fahrenheit. It's almost a twin of the Earth, but you realize they have a runaway greenhouse effect on Venus. And if you go to Jupiter, well, Jupiter has a gaseous surface and gigantic uh, gas clouds and radiation. So the gas giants are unsuitable, and it's really cold out there. But Mars was once upon a time tropical, believe it or not. In fact, DNA may have first started first on Mars. Maybe an asteroid plowed into Mars and blew some of that DNA into outer space, which may have seeded the Earth. And believe it or not, there are some physicists and astronomers who believe that maybe, just maybe, we are the Martians that maybe life started on Mars first and then seeded the Earth. So the point is that Mars is ready to be colonized. Uh, perhaps in the next 15 or 20 years or so, the first expeditions will be sent to the Red Planet. Uh, the President of the United States last December signed it as a national directive. We go back to the moon, then on to Mars. Then we're going to create a colony, a permanent self-sustaining colony on Mars, and then begins a process of terraforming Mars that is making Mars into a Garden of Eden. Uh, one way to do that, for example, is to have satellites orbit Mars that reflect sunlight down to the polar ice caps, melting the ice caps so that liquid water once again flows freely into the oceans and riverbeds of Mars. However, the question remains, if Mars is going to be burnt up when the sun becomes a red giant at the same time as Earth, what's the point in going to all that trouble terraforming it? Uh, well, terraforming would only take uh, on the scale of a century or two. And by then, uh, you know, on a scale of thousands of years, we could actually have a vibrant civilization uh, on Mars and, of course, we would have to leave the Earth on a scale of 4 billion years when the sun starts to expand into a red giant and eats up the Earth. But that gives us plenty of time. That gives us plenty of time to begin the process of colonizing our solar system and then beginning uh, the first ventures to the nearby stars. And so we have plenty of time on a scale of five, 4 or 5 billion years. We have plenty of time to begin the colonization of the solar system and, if necessary, leave the solar system entirely when the sun turns into a red giant. In so the, it's the law of physics. Yeah, but the law of physics that we will have to leave the Earth. In the long term, we might have to leave the universe. I mean, the universe itself, as you say in your book, may succumb to the big freeze on account of the constant expansion unless it reverses itself. Yeah, believe it or not, uh, physics gives a death warrant for the universe itself. Uh, the universe is in a runaway mode. We know that the expansion is accelerating, not slowing down, as we previously thought. And if this runaway effect keeps on going, temperatures will drop to near absolute zero. The night sky will be totally black, 
no more stars uh, lighting up the sky at all billions of years from now. And it means that, well, the universe itself may die when temperatures plunge down to absolute zero. Now, in my book, I speculate, and this is pure speculation now, that when the time <laughs> comes that, that we are faced with the death of the universe itself, maybe we should leave the universe. Uh, the latest theory of cosmology says that big bangs can happen all the time. This is called inflation. String theory says uh, there could be a multiverse of universes out there. If you saw the movie Interstellar, uh, there was a physicist who actually used string theory at the very end of the movie to go between dimensions, to go to another sector of the universe. And so this, of course, is science fiction, but it's well within the known laws of physics that perhaps Perhaps one day when the universe itself becomes super cold, that we leave the universe and join another much warmer universe. We create a dimensional lifeboat that allows us to leave our bubble universe and move to another warmer bubble universe. Part of this project, of course, is uh, immortality or the human connectome project, which could kind of map every neuron, neuron in the brain and... And, and laser port, as you talk about in your book. You're a techno-optimist, right? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, uh, digital immortality is something that even Silicon Valley entrepreneurs are exploring. Yeah. To digitize everything known about the human personality and the body, so that even if you die, your image, your holographic image with all your memories, will survive and become immortal. This is a real possibility, and I think that once we do this, we will put all the information of our personality onto a laser beam and shoot the laser beam into outer space. What happens to the body? Uh, well, in outer space, in one second you're on the moon and you're downloaded, downloaded into a mainframe, mainframe computer on the moon which controls a mechanical avatar. This mechanical avatar looks like you, except it is superhuman. It's like Superman or a Superwoman. It can survive on Jupiter, it can survive on Saturn, it can survive on any of the planets, and it has your personality hardwired into the programming of the machine. So once again, laser porting means putting all your data of your personality and brain onto a laser beam, shooting it into space, downloading it on the moon or Mars, and then it then controls an avatar, a mechanical avatar, with superhuman strength, and you wake up one day Superman or Superwoman. Can you understand, Dr. Kaku, that some people might be a little unnerved to think that the future of humankind is in the hands of rich white men, Elon Musk and Peter Thiel and Jeff Bezos? Well, it's up for grabs. In other words, no one is saying that you have to be white and male in order to build the rockets and soar into outer space. It's up for grabs. Uh, look at the Internet. We have entrepreneurs in, in China, Indonesia, Hong Kong, Singapore. They're jumping on the bandwagon because science does not prefer any one particular kind of ethnic group. It's up for grabs. If you want to create a robot, if you want to create a new software program that's going to take the world by, by surprise and make you a billionaire, go for it. There's no law of science that says that people in the third world can't become billionaires. In fact, some of them have, simply because they've seized the opportunity. Science shows no ethnic bias. It's up for grabs. Anyone can soar to the highest reaches of of uh, the, the cyber culture. It does help if you're a billionaire, however, does it not? It does. However, Mark Zuckerberg, hey, look, he was a teenager, a teenager when he began to dream about Facebook, and he, he assembled the whole thing when he was in his 20s. Can you imagine that? It, the future is up for grabs. Now, of course, people like to complain and bellyache and says, oh, it's all just for rich people, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's for losers. If you are a winner... You want to, you realize that this cyber future is for everybody. It's up for grabs. It's a level playing field when it comes to creating software. Do you, you don't have to have muscles. You don't have to have a big bank account. Uh, poor kids uh, can write programs that take the, the world by surprise. Do you 
think that the, this idea of humanity moving off onto other planets is, is a kind of religious idea like the rapture. You know, if we are clever enough, assiduous enough, we shall be saved. Well, realize that anything can be made into a religious movement. However, I'm a scientist. I believe in the laws of physics. And the laws of physics are very clear. We have to leave the Earth because one day the Earth will be uninhabitable. And we can even give you realistic scenarios where this could happen. Now, of course, that doesn't prevent gurus and cultists from trying to seize control of this. But what I'm saying is the laws of physics are very clear that we have to, at some point, begin the process of leaving the Earth. One could give up. I mean, what is the point of addressing global warming or reducing our use of plastic if we are planning on leaving anyway? Well, we're not saying that we should venture to Mars in order to leave the Earth, uh, become a, a garbage can and po be polluted and have global warming. No. On Earth, we have to solve Earth problems. We can't use outer space as an escape. We have to solve the problem of global warming, nuclear proliferation, biogerms on the Earth as Earthlings. And we shouldn't use going to Mars as an excuse to, to neglect these problems. And so I'm saying that if you are an Earthling, it's your duty to try to save the planet. Yep, and that's Dr. Michio Kaku, theoretical physicist. His latest book is called The Future of Humanity, in which he expands on those ideas.